All right, welcome to Your Best Life today. Today's guest is Patrick Harrington. Uh, but before we get started, I uh, just want to read to you the quote of the day. Um, Commitment is an act, not a word. And I thought that was a great quote um, to, to sit with with Patrick Harrington. Our guest today um, leads a life that truly inspires him. He's a, a former serial entrepreneur. Uh, Patrick is the founder owner of Kindness Yoga, which is a donation-based collection of studios in Colorado. They host uh, many, many teachers and tens of thousands of yoga students annually. And right now they have six studios, so they're growing fast here in Colorado. Patrick's the proud father of two girls and a great husband. Just ask his wife. And Patrick has taught uh, uh, many yoga teacher trainings. He's a, he's a business coach and coaches many of the teachers who teach at Kindness Yoga. Uh, thanks for being on the show, Patrick. Thank you. Pleasure to be here with you, Eric. Yeah, now I caught a quote on your, um, on your bio that I thought was, was interesting. Um, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But before we get started, um, I guess I'm most curious, what's, what, why are you so passionate about yoga? Like, like what brought you to this path? Um, well, yoga for me is a, a, an entry point for, for so many areas of inquiry whether that be a physical inquiry or a emotional inquiry or a spiritual inquiry. And for me, uh, my purpose in life and kind of my, one of my big passions is personal transformation and, and self inquiry and self awareness and, and really um, looking to change the patterns that I am aware of that I notice in my own life that, that aren't working as well as I'd like them to. And so by practicing yoga, uh, I have found that it's a, uh, a keyhole or a key, uh, an entrance uh, into yeah, a regular ritualized practice for uh, self-inquiry and, and self-transformation. And then uh, when I started taking yoga in 1990 was my kind of first introduction to yoga with my mom at a basics class. Um, I was really into the physical and that was when I was, um, you know, in my late teens and, uh, quite frankly, there was beautiful people there and pretty girls and, um, everyone was really nice and friendly and it was, it felt like a very accepting environment and, and I felt good physically afterwards. And so that was really the beginning inquiry. And I think for so many people, um, feeling good in their bodies is something that is rare or uh, doesn't happen nearly as often as I would hope it does. And so uh, yoga from the very basic level, the very basic beginning classes is a way for you to access feeling better and starting to change some of the patterns um, that may not be working in your physical body. And then inevitably um, from the physical, if you stick with the practice, it starts to bring up some of the emotions and some of the energy um, patterns in your body that are stuck in your tissues. The phrase, your issues are in your tissues, always resonated with me. And so inevitably, as you start to open up these physical patterns um, and work with them, the emotional and energetic patterns begin to come up to be noticed and to be made aware of and, and to looked at. And, and then you start to have choice about them because so often... I know that when I have uh, a, an emotional pattern or an energetic pattern that is not working, I'm often not, not necessarily aware that it's not working. It's kind of operating in the background. And um, so as awareness comes with the physical exploration through the emotional uh, exploration, I think um, by sticking with it, it inevitably leads you to an inquiry about, you know, why am I here? And, um, what are the more spiritual or esoteric questions that I have? And uh, it begins a beautiful yeah, journey in, inside. And it's what I find so often from watching students and teachers is that, that so many of the answers that we seek um, from outside actually occur on the mat for us uh, through the practice. And... Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's really a passion about seeing my own and others' patterns that aren't working transform into something that works better. Great. Thank you. 
Um, what, what practices do you suggest for people? A lot of the people who watch Your Best Life um, may already have a, a yoga practice or a meditation practice. Um, you know, there's so many different things you can do to, to just have more peace and ease and joy in your life. Um, you know, as a longtime yoga instructor and a, a studio owner, um, what, do you, what do you see as the most powerful practices for people to really, you know, when you've seen them really transform? Yeah, thank you. From my, from my own experience of um, really asking what is going to be the, the f most efficient way to change um, for myself, I found it is ritual and schedule um, make a huge difference for me. And that means that um, I get up at 5.30 every day, um, regardless of what occurred the night before, and um, meditate with my wife. We meditate together. And um, so that's a half an hour to an hour sitting, uh, generally led meditation um, with headphones on, but sitting together and uh, really spurring each other on. If, if one of us had a later night or didn't sleep as well, the other will say, come on, you know, you know, it'll, you know it's going to help. You know, you're going to feel better. And, and so you have a buddy, in my case, to kind of get you going. Um, before I was meditating with my wife, a good friend of mine uh, and I would call each other at 530 or send a text and say, going in or it's on or, um, mm -hmm. you know, starting now. And so that you know that you have a friend, um, somebody else, an accountability partner that is also um, going into it with you, I think is really powerful and doing it every single day. Um, there's really no excuse for not meditating. Um, I remember this book called uh, Living with a Seal. And it's uh, not a seal in the animal sense, but a seal um, uh, from more of the military and the special forces uh, seals. And uh, the story of this retired SEAL who had uh, four alarm clocks <laughs> so that he had absolutely no excuse for not getting up at five o'clock to start his ritual, to start his pattern, because he found that discipline um, first thing in the morning from the moment that that alarm clock hits, that you get out of bed immediately, that there's no snooze, there's no pausing, but that you start from that first sound. Um, really sets a tone for the rest of your day and your ability to make choices that are better for you and in your best interest later on. And so um, meditation is huge and doing it every single day, um, momentum starts to build such that it becomes easier. And I, for one, really notice if a day uh, is missed. It used to be that when I went on vacation, uh, we wouldn't get up early, right? We're on vacation, we're supposed to be sleeping. Um, our vacations now, uh, there's no break from meditation. When we go and visit in-laws, we get up early and we meditate at the in-laws house and it makes such a huge difference everywhere. So that's, that's a big, that's a big piece. And, and, and from there, the, what occurs is, uh, a, a deeper awareness of yourself. And that starts to point at how you feel after you eat certain things, how you feel after you watch certain genres of television or movies, um, what types of books you're reading, what types of friends and relationships you're having and how they make you feel. And you're, you're just able to tune in more on what actually feels good and in, in the direction that you want to go and what actually is off and taking you further from your intentions. And so if there was one thing that you could do that would make a difference in your life, it would be to pause, wake up early and uh, take a pause of uh, 30 minutes before checking email, before looking at your phone, uh, before anything. And uh, what works for me is, is um, guided meditations or binaural beats meditations, um, really powerful stuff. Great. You know, it's so, so great you're saying all this because I always think about you can go to Barnes and Noble or Amazon these days and there's a million self-help books and there, there's so many practices out there and so many things you can do. Um, but if you just did one of them, if there was a true path, something that really worked and you did it every day, it, it, it would actually work. Uh, but people, I think, you know, tend to kind of bounce around to all these different ideas and, and things to try. Uh, 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, it's the, it's the way that the self-help industry um, continues to make money. It's uh, Sherry Huber, a really um, inspirational Buddhist meditation teacher once said to me, um, you know, Patrick, if self-help books worked, they would have. <laughs> and I always thought that was like so simple and profound that, um, you know, in her, in her work, you know, it, it really, for me, points at the search is inside. And yet um, that doesn't necessarily keep sales repeating and repeating and repeating. So most books or directions ask you to look at, continue to look and to continue to try and find something outside of yourself or another practice that will make a difference. But man, if you just be quiet every day, um, the momentum that occurs after 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, it, it's so subtle and yet it is the core of um, the ease in that, that making changes can be. Mm -hmm. I think what you said was so important. I just kind of want to review it. Um, so to, to, you know, the most important practice, if you had to choose one would be meditation. Uh, but that could be, that could be asana for someone that's very important to them or, or another practice, but to, to actually do it every day, you said uh, ritual is important. Um, being on a schedule, having an accountability partner um, and that discipline is, is important. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Like, um, what, what keeps you going every day? Cause, cause that seems to be what really does the trick is consistency. Yeah. Consistency. And, uh, to me, it, you have to care about something. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, one of the, one of the biggest changes for me has been fatherhood and, um, gratefully, uh, from having children, I now look at everything different. Uh, there is a true feeling of accountability for the future and for times when I may not be here. And so uh, that has been a big part of me having the discipline to be consistent. And so what if you don't have kids? What if, what if um, that's, that's not where you're at at this moment? Um, then I think that it's very, very important to dig deep into what it is that you care about and um, find something that you care about and then use that as inspiration for drive and, and motivation to do things that will make you a better person so that you can care with more uh, efficacy and uh, result. And so uh, I think that, that, you know, discipline more and more, we're finding that it is a, it is a finite um, skill set or finite mm, amount of energy akin to willpower, discipline. And uh, when you do the first thing in the morning, something that is good for you, and you actually, in the beginning, you make it a little uncomfortable because what it causes is it causes you to think about your activities at night. It causes you to think about your bedtime. And why do you think about your bedtime? Well, because I have to get up to do this thing that makes everything better. Those kind of choices um, and disciplines um, cause you to make different choices later in the day. You know, whether or not I want to have an alcohol drink at night, I know that when I drink alcohol at night, um, it causes me to loosen my boundaries. And so maybe I stay up later. And so when that alarm clock hits at 5.30, it's kind of a question of how much pain do I want to feel? <laughs> because I'm committed to this path that I care about so much that I will go through the pain, whatever it is. If I go to bed at 4 o'clock or if I go to bed at 9 o'clock, I'm getting up at 5.30 to meditate. And I'm not going to let my wife down because she's here with me. And so somebody, you know, one of us has to step up for the other. We get to step up, I should say. We don't have to do anything. We get to. And, um, and so doing that first thing in the morning, uh, I believe that it strengthens um, and, and increases our ability to make um, choices that are better for us, which, you know, a.k.a. discipline or willpower. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will say, um, I don't have time to meditate. And, and knowing you personally, 
um, I know that you own six yoga studios and, and that you are really showing up for a lot of people in the community and for a lot of your students, um, but you still find the time. And I know as well that, that I don't think you wear it like a badge. A lot of people are really proud that they're very, very busy and they work a lot. And, you know, I find that you're, you're not afraid to say, um, you know, I'm taking some time with my family. I'm, I'm not too busy today. You know, I'm having a, a nice, easy day. So, you know, um, can you speak to that a little bit to busy Americans that are too busy to, to find peace in their life or time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing how distracted I made myself for so many years in order to not feel. And um, by that, I mean, I would, uh, start, I would start a business or I would um, say yes to a meeting or to a project or to an opportunity. I was a yes man. And in being a yes man, I got to feel uh, really kind of important. So I would say yes to lots of activities, lots of opportunities. And I would feel important because I was um, under the guise of helping somebody or under the guise of uh, yeah, being a good friend. And, and so everything had the, the same amount of priority. Mm. And um, no matter if it was an email, for, um, you know, signing a petition to save the Royal Gorge from mining, or if it was um, a friend reaching out um, uh, just to say hello, or my bookkeeper saying, you know, the bank account's running low, what do we do? Um, I literally would just answer them in the order that they came into my life. And uh, I found that the charge that I got, the return on investment that I got from being a yes man, um, ultimately left me feeling ragged, overwhelmed, um, anxious, and really, really not present with anything. I was always thinking about something else. Mm. And so, uh, again, finding something that I care about has um, shifted that perspective. And what I get is, is that no and boundary is the way that I get to say yes to what I care about. And so I actually have to, uh, for me, I needed to prune back. And that meant cut off um, many relationships, um, opportunities, businesses, um, yeah, things that would, in my hedonistic way, be things that I would do without thinking about it, like watching a, a basketball game or watching a football game or whatever. Um, if I think about my, my bigger mission, then those, so many of the things I was saying yes to, there was no room for them. They, they did not land high enough in my priorities for me to sacrifice the potential of moving forward what I care about. And, um, and now I'm 43 and I'm, I'm witnessing the beautiful growth of two little girls and I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm aware now of the temporality of um, my existence. And so um, I feel like I, being aware that there is a time when I, when I will be either contemplating my own death in my imminent death, or it may happen, you know, without my, without me being aware of it, it may be more sudden than that. I, um, I want to, I want to spend my time doing the things that give me the most return on my investment. And so, uh, consequently, that means that I say no a lot more than I say yes. And so if there was a way for um, busy Americans to make a shift, um, number one would be meditation. And then number two would be uh, from and out of that meditation practice to get really clear about what you care about. And from being clear about what you care about, decide what is in alignment with that and uh, decide what is not in alignment with that. And the things that are not in alignment with that bow out as gracefully as you can or slam the door shut, <laughs> whatever is needed in order to preserve your energy for what you care about because you have a finite amount of time here. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. So it's all about knowing what you want and what your mission is and then uh, prioritizing accordingly and not treating everything that comes into your life with the same amount of value. That doesn't really make any sense. I, I used to do that too, just kind of go down my emails and just take action on each one. But now I, uh, I use a technique you taught me and that was, um, that was from a book, right? What book would you recommend to someone um, or multiple books um, to kind of get on track for what they want and then to accomplish it? Because I know there's two parts. I know like when The Secret came out, that was the big thing, right? All the yogis and myself included, you make your vision board, you put the million dollar check up there and you look at it and it's just going to happen. Mm. Now I feel like there's a second wave where it's like, no, you actually have to take some actions and, and maybe change the way you do things. Um, so any more advice on there? Any, any books that you'd recommend? Yeah, absolutely. The One Thing is a powerful, powerful book um, that changes lives. And uh, the essence of it is um, every single day, figure out what the most important action that you could take mm -hmm. is and, um, and then take it. And sometimes at, at the expense of other things that uh, might be pulling at your attention, but to no matter what accomplish the one thing that will move the majority of your life and energy forward. And it, it really points at, at its essence, uh, Pareto's law, the 80, 20 law, or 20% of your energy and effort creates 80% of your results. And uh, likewise, 20% of um, your problems or things that are in the way uh, create 80% of the resistance. And so by focusing on the 20% of um, action that can make the 80% of your result every single day, you have 365 days of um, really powerful actions happening over the course of a year that is transformational and will move the energy in a major, major way. So that was a, that was a seminal book for me and one that I suggest to people all the time. Um, and then recently I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it and I know that you and Eric, Eric and I talked about it. What's the name of the feng shui book that we talked about? Oh yeah, that was surprisingly uh, powerful. I, I just feng shui my whole um, house <laughs> <laughs> and I started with my clothes and you put all the clothes in one spot and um, it blows your mind how much clothes you have first of all. And then you hold each pair, each piece of clothing and you feel energetically how it, it feels to you. And that was such a genius way. And I could really feel um, which pieces I wanted to keep and which I wanted to let go. And I, it was funny because my mind wanted to over, overcome that a little bit and be like, no, I should, I should want to keep this. This is a new piece of clothing or something like that. Um, but it didn't bring joy to my life, so I let it go. And um, it's been so clean and fun around my house since then. Every piece of clothing I wear... And that's just part of it. It has, has felt really good. And it's something to do with the magic of the, mm, what is the magic of tidying up? I think the magic of tidying up. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a New York times bestseller right now, uh, January, 2016. Um, so that one is, is, uh, is very powerful. And, and it, it, it really points at the opportunity to do that, not only with your physical things, but your physical things that hold, hold the story of your past, when you look around your house, you're really looking at artifacts that describe um, to somebody who would walk in there, they describe a story. And when you pick up your things, you pick up um, a piece of your story. And so when I think about making big change in my life, if I look around my house and I see uh, stories from all different times in my past, when I was literally a different person, um, if it doesn't inspire me today, then it has no room for where I'm going because in the temporal reality of how long we have here, I'm not um, focusing backwards. I'm focusing in the present moment and what happens now is either inspiring or I need to choose out of it and point towards something that is because um, that's, just, that's just some of the options that we have at least many of us in this culture, other places where, you know, you're, you're dealing with uh, basic needs like shelter or food or uh, safety, you may not have that freedom to make those, to perceive, to make those choices. But for us in this culture and many of the people that are going to watch this, when you look at it, you are gifted with the ability to make choices about how you spend your time and, um, 
um, you know, cutting out what does not inspire you um, from your relationships to your clothing uh, will make a tremendous difference. Thank you very much. Now, this is uh, interesting to me because you're you're a yoga studio owner, um, and this 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 is going to be watched by mostly um, yogis. And in the states, um, at least you know the last few years, a lot of people relate to yoga uh, through asana, through the physical poses. And um, it's it's you know we haven't talked about asana at all yet, and we probably won't get to that in this call. And I I think that's interesting. Um, can you talk to you know someone that's new to the practice that that is just going in it for the workout maybe or relates to it in that way? How does yoga unfold in, into this whole lifestyle? And also, um, I know you're a big advocate of yoga teacher training. Um, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Like why, um, if someone doesn't even want to be a yoga teacher, I've heard, I did my yoga teacher training even though I didn't intend to be a yoga teacher. Um, how can that benefit someone as well? I, I believe that's one of your passions is like, let's, let's get everyone in a yoga teacher training. So, um, yeah, how does asana become a lifestyle and, and why are yoga teacher trainings um, beneficial? Yeah, for sure. That's a little bit better view. Um, thank you. It's it's uh, it's such a pleasure to offer adult education, and that I don't even know what adult means, but um, education by choice, I should say, and that's what um, yoga teacher training is, and that's what yoga classes are. Um, to me, what's unique about uh, yoga, and to somebody that's just getting involved with it. Um, you know, it, from the outside, it looks like stretching and, um, that, that is some part of what occurs inside the room. Um, but the, the big thing that I think happens is that when you as a, um, self-directed person choose to pay money to somebody to lead you through a physical set of positions with other people doing the same thing. And then also um, share some basic truths with you, like if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You, you are literally opening up the physical patterns in your body while at the same time taking in information to your mind that um, potentially was forgotten or, or not, didn't feel relevant. And um, so within the mind-body connection, as you're opening up the physical patterns of your body, you're literally making space for new information to come into your tissues. Your issues are in your tissues. Well, your freedom is also in your tissues. And so as you come into a yoga class for the first time and you do a forward bend, you may look around the room and see somebody touching their forehead to the top of their feet. And you're like, oh my God, that's nothing like me. I can't even touch my knees. But the thing is, is that the person with their forehead to their feet is feeling something akin to what you're feeling trying to touch your knees because an edge is an edge regardless of if it looks like uh, forehead to toes or fingertips to kneecaps everybody is feeling something similar and in that feeling something similar there is a unity there is a commonality where you know all throughout the day there can be different things going on and we're all so different and we're all such individuals but when you're in the room and you're doing a forward bend and you can't touch your knees and the other guy can touch his forehead to his toes you are still you are in that moment feeling something similar and whether we're cognitively aware of that or not it makes a difference in how we see each other and um and so that piece of coming in and getting adult education on a class by class basis. Inevitably, if you stick with yoga for 30 days, give it a try three to four days a week and really try and pay attention to, to what you're feeling, how your, how your life is going, what your perspectives are, your, your emotional state. My guess is that you will see some positive changes from, from just that, three to four, two to three times a week, three to four times a week, you really start to see some shifts. And for a lot of people, they're like, wow, that was great. And I'm sleeping better. I'm, I'm going to the bathroom more regularly. I'm making better food choices. Um, I'm not crashing energy wise in the afternoon. 
I'm not reacting so intensely to my children or to my partner or to my dog or to my parents or to my cousin or whatever. And I'm just feeling better in life somehow from just doing these positions and being in community and hearing somebody. Um, what else can I do? What, where, where do I get more of this? And uh, right now in our industry, uh, in the yoga industry, it's like we're, we're really watching the birth and the birthing of an industry in yoga in the United States. It's, it's relatively young as an industry and it's caught fire, which is I'm grateful for because of the difference it makes, but it's still developing. And so consequently, there are workshops that you could take that would deepen it, that would be you know anywhere from three hours on a Sunday to a weekend, to a three day weekend, to a retreat down in, a, in, a, in some locale where you're doing yoga every day. And then kind of the ultimate uh, self-development opportunity is yoga teacher training. And why that's so powerful is um, that you are with a group of people for anywhere between four weeks to 12 weeks to some trainings that are six to nine months in length. And all of the people that are in the training for their own reasons have chosen to invest a considerable amount of money into this training. Now, why that's significant is because, you know, money represents energy. It represents their time that they took or someone's time to earn this energy in exchange for the time and energy that the instructors and the location will give back to you. And when everybody is doing that, and it's in the direction of something that opens you up and exposes you to new perspectives and information, um, there's a really special um, connection that comes within the group. And it may be unique to any connection that most people have had, except for maybe, you know, in a church group or in, some kind of spiritual community where, or maybe a family, but um, people being investing significantly in themselves with other people doing the same means that the level of intention, the level of attention that people are giving to um, learning the postures, learning the philosophy, learning the anatomy, the way the body works, um, causes you to grow tremendously. And you come up against your edges. It's not always comfortable. You're um, in a room with anywhere between 15 and 30 very sweaty people that are, you know, added something time intensive to their life. And so they have their own stresses, their own anxieties, their own challenges about that. And you're rubbing up inevitably against each other. And so in our society where it can be convenient just to disconnect from that and leave, well, you invested too much. So you actually have to work it out. And um, so friendships are developed, um, you know, strategies for communication occur and all the while you are opening up your physical body and shifting and transforming the patterns of your physical body while getting downloaded information, um, that's all about, um, how the body works in spirit and life and each other. And so I cannot think of a better boot camp for, uh, getting somebody ready to make any kind of transition in their life or to feel more confident. Um, lastly, I'll say that one of the most transformational aspects of yoga teacher training is um, the public speaking part of it. Because public speaking is one of the um, top fears, if not the top fear for most people on the planet. And it's one that doesn't get addressed, um, really, unless, unless you, you have to really want to address it and have a venue to do so. Well, in yoga teacher training, it's a small group of people that get to know each other very well. And so it's the perfect place to address what for many people is the number one fear. And when you address that number one fear and you stand in front of your small group of four other yogis or at some point towards the end of the training in front of a, a larger group of friends and family or the yoga teacher training as a whole, you are addressing one of the most um, fear inducing um, activities that we know of. And by doing that with support and training and encouragement, um, you, you break through that idea of, of public speaking being scary. And on the other side of that is a feeling of being able to do anything. And so, yeah, at the end of it, you will also be able to guide a group of people through some asana, yoga asana. But um, that will be, in my opinion, um, 
maybe the least um, powerful aspect of doing a yoga teacher training. It's uh, you really get the gift of um, an empowered and transformed you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, as we're getting towards the end of the call, I, I do have um, one more important question, I think. Um, a lot of the conversation so far has been about, you know, what can I do to feel better in my life to, you know, the, the title of this whole show is your best life. You know, it, um, what if someone said to you, yogis, you know, yoga people, meditators, they're, they're selfish. They're only thinking of themselves. They're, they're, they're so consumed with, I'm going to do this yoga class. I'm going to take a teacher training. I'm going to, I'm thinking about what I want to eat. I'm gluten free. I'm, uh, I'm meditating, you know, um, and then you, you have this contrasted with, you know, these, these challenging things that happen in the world, Columbine, the, the bombing in Paris, the Sandy Hook, wars. Um, you know, why don't you get out there in the world and do something to change it? Um, you know, I know the answer to this, and I, I'm a believer that, that if we shift um, our souls and ourselves, that this whole world is going to work itself out in a very beautiful way. And, and I'm, I've also heard it put, like, if you're in an airplane, they always tell you if there's an emergency and the oxygen mask comes down, you put yours on first and then you help other people. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Like where does, how will this change the world in, in a good way, in a meaningful way by doing your own work? Thank you. I, I think it's a, a, a powerful question. And um, what comes to me is that um, as yogis or as, as meditators or as people that are on a, um, or, 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 or are in the midst of a spiritual inquiry of some kind, um, I, I believe that my inquiry through yoga and meditation and eating, eating in a way that is in alignment with me feeling good only allows me to have more time and energy for the world, for making a difference in the world. And, and making a difference in the world is, a, is an, interesting, an interesting concept because um, the world is really everybody's perception, right? It's you have the world in your perception, Eric. I have the world in my perception. My mom has her world in her perception. And so really it's, it, it doesn't have to be more than to make a difference in the world, I really need to start, or I really want to start with making a difference in my world. And why that's a great place to start is because from having um, a life that is healthy, that is focused towards um, living a life uh, led by spirit, um, led by a mission, led by what you really truly care about, um, we serve as examples for all the people that are in our circle of influence. And um, my experience for, from taking time for myself to make sure that I am centered and um, well-fed and have the chance to, to sleep well and do all the things that really take care of a person, man, I am fully available for the limited amount of time that I have to interact with uh, with the world at large and with my work, and um, so such that my my impact is greater, and uh, I ultimately feel more effective. So, yeah, it's I, I think it's an interesting uh, concept, the idea of martyrdom to make a difference, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily resonate with me. The people that I see that are overworked overstressed, overwhelmed, trying to make a difference. I, I don't know how effective they're being. And um, that could be a triggering statement to somebody who's feeling overwhelmed, overstressed and overworked about something that they care about. And, um, and so I, I agree, or I, I wanna state that that's simply my projection in that situation. But uh, to be effective, to be powerful in the world, I think that from my own experience, the only thing that you can do is take care of yourself first and uh, literally follow the stewardess's um, uh, instructions, please. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my Buddhism teacher talks about how um, 
how you would want to take care of yourself before you you go out there and take care of the world. He uses the analogy of the angry peace protester. <laughs> you go to, you go to this peace rally and, and everyone's angrily like pushing for for world peace. Yeah. Um, it might be a little more productive to go inside and calm down and find some peace and find some space and and, and then you can be available to serve others from that space. Right, well said. Very good. So um, this is from a friend at, at Bulletproof uh, Radio. It's a, one of the number one um, health and wellness podcasts out there and um, hope to emulate Dave. He, he, he does a great job helping others. Um, one of his questions he asks all his guests, and I'm doing the same on Your Best Life, is, is um, from all your experience, um, not just in the yoga world, but just all of your life, uh, what are the three things that you'd recommend to someone that they can put into action today, like something that's really easy to take action on, or not necessarily easy, but something very powerful that you can take action on uh, that'll really lead to their best life. Yeah, number one we covered pretty extensively would be um, creating ritual around meditation and making that an everyday thing. And the, the thing I would say about that is um, try it for 30 days. Make a commitment to get up, earlier so that you you have time because you're not doing anything at 5 or 5.30 or 4.30. You're not doing anything. So to say that you don't have time is, is not authentic in that way. And uh, try 30 days for 30 minutes every morning. Um, number two, I would say something really simple is make sure you're drinking enough water. Your body runs um, on being hydrated. It's an electrical system that when it's dehydrated just does not work well. It doesn't make good decisions. It makes decisions from a, from a um, back of the head, more animal brain perspective. And so um, quite simply, drink enough. And then uh, number three is sleep enough. Sleep cycles are 90 minutes in general. So that means that you go in and through the full sleep, sleep cycle and then back up close to consciousness every 90 minutes. And so my general rule of thumb around setting my alarm clock and when I go to bed is I do it in increments of three, four and a half, six, or seven and a half hours. And, you know, sometimes when it's the case, nine hours. And I have found that that makes a huge difference. And so I'll set my alarm. I usually give myself 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep. And, um, and then I set my alarm based on those increments of 90 minutes, such that when I wake up, I'm generally coming out of a dream st state and, and closer to consciousness anyway. And so even if you're only getting, um, you know, four and a half hours of sleep, four and a half hours of sleep is better than five in my experience of it. So give that a try. Um, set your alarm based on when you go to bed with 15, 20 minutes as a, as a lead time and then uh, 90 minute cycles uh, in terms of when you get up to meditate. Great. Wow. So ritual around meditation, um, 30 days for 30 minutes per day, drink tons of water and sleep enough and use those 90 minute sleep cycles. Um, is there a book that, um, that you know of that, that talks about that or some resource about the sleep research or is that just something that's that simple? We don't even need to read more than that. Uh, great question. I don't have one. I, I, that, um, information came from my uncle who, um, is a uh, sleep researcher. And so um, it was just his, it was just an anecdote when we were talking about sleep, and uh, and then it was retold to me um, by my chiropractor, and so it's out there somewhere, but it wasn't something that I read in a book, and um, from experience, um, it's really worked for me. So um, you know, I would say dive in, and again, for for many things, try it for thirty days, try it every day for thirty days, try drinking eight glasses of water every day for thirty days, and see what happens because that'll give you enough time, you know, one cycle of the moon, it'll give you enough time to see, did it make a difference? And when you think about the length of your whole life, one month is no time at all to potentially find something that will make a huge difference. Great, now Kindness Yoga, if you're in Colorado, Kindness Yoga has six locations and it's just uh, growing quickly. Uh, and Patrick is a resource as well uh, for coaching and, and um, all kinds of different um, ways to create your best life. Patrick, can you tell us um, how people can learn more about kindness or you as a coach, uh, you know, where to find you online or? Sure. Thank you. Uh, kindnesscollective.com is our website. And um, 
yeah, very excited about the community that is coming up around kindness and and kindness is a, uh, a business that's uh, as transparent as I thought we could be by naming ourselves kindness. So that's what we're about. And that's what we're constantly striving towards. It's not an end. It's a process. So we're all kind of detoxing the things that aren't kind out of ourselves um, by working within our studios and teaching within our studios and by uh, coming as a student and contributing your money in the form, you know, your energy in the form of money to a place called kindness. So always appreciate the support for the studios and the mission and, um, you know, helping teachers to make uh, um, a living wage or a good second income as a yoga teacher is a big part of our mission. So thank you for all your support if you can come and take class. And then for me, I, I do uh, have a limited um, number of spaces for one-on-one -on -one coaching and um, Eric and I have worked together. And so he's somebody that you can talk to for a referral if, if he feels uh, that's appropriate for you. And um, you can reach out to me at patrick at kindnesscollective.com for any inquiries about one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching as well. Great. So we'll head over to kindnesscollective.com to learn more. And I want to wrap up with the quote of the day that started this whole thing. Commitment is an act, not a word. Uh, so Patrick and I uh, are challenging everyone listening to this or watching it online uh, to live your best life. Uh, start today, do it for 30 days, and, and if you just take one thing from this, whether it's the meditation, the water, getting enough sleep, that's a fun one. Uh, try it for 30 days, and and uh, let's have some fun with it. So thanks for your time, Patrick. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Eric. Really appreciate you.